Okay. So I I think we can uh, we can start now. Uh, this is also being streamed live on Facebook. So there would be some people who would be connecting via that as well. So um, before we begin, I just uh, wanted to give a give all of you who are seeing this today a brief uh, introduction uh, of the speakers who have joined with us today and uh, today is a very as a writer myself today for me is a very very special episode because uh, when i first read surat fall of a port rise of a prince back in 2018 i was completely blown and uh, today when i'm getting the opportunity to talk with the author himself of that book it's it's it does not show on my face but i'm screaming inside just like i'm fan girling majorly so uh thank you so much sir for joining us today i feel so privileged and i feel so honored uh to have you with us today and uh, uh i will pass on the buck to you uh and uh, let's let's begin okay thank you um, saloni for giving me the opportunity and uh, you know it's always um, good to connect uh, back with india uh, especially in these times and i hope you and all the people who have uh, you know taken the time out to log in have been keeping safe in these extraordinary times it's um, it's 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 an extraordinary time for mankind not just for um, you know nations or countries um, and the only way we can spread knowledge is through uh mediums like zoom and and it's wonderful that you have been at the forefront of this particular activity so congratulations on that as well um and also uh, wishing everyone uh in india a belated happy diwali you know i hope you guys had a wonderful um um you know wonderful festive season um i know it's been you know it's it's shrouded under this this awful uh pandemic but um you know my greetings to all of you um sorry uh well should we just start off with the book and you know how um i got to writing it and telling the story as well are you okay with that yes absolutely all right so um um the reason firstly why i wrote this book um is uh primarily to tell the story of how the english east india company uh, came to annex surat um and uh, from there on um uh, virtually destroy surat's trading prowess um and build bombay uh the other part of the story that 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 you know had captured my imagination as a child was the story of the prince of surat who actually went to britain in 1844 and then again in 1854 to challenge the british empire and um while there has been much written about how the british annexed um uh, awadh which was you know which was as we know as lucknow uh, and how they took uh, uh awadh how they annexed uh, jhansi uh, how the how the english east india company annexed mysore to a certain extent um, how they deposed the kings of satara uh how they actually uh, uh you know led this rather pernicious campaign against various uh, you know indian principalities not much was written about how the east india company annexed surat in fact it was uh, a part of our colonial history which um which had been forgotten it was a forgotten chapter of our colonial history and i thought it was vital that this story uh, came you know back uh, into the memories um of of uh, of readers who are interested in that particular phase of 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 empire or or british india if you wish or the ascendancy of the east india company so these were the two predominant reasons um as to why i wrote the book um the story actually begins with um uh, surat as a city and what surat actually was uh, you know uh, going all the way back from uh, from the from the um 14th or even the 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 13th century um surat because of its geographical location found itself at the crossroads of trade uh, that that um, that you know that 
at, at a confluence point, basically, of trade that went all the way from the Mediterranean, where the Ottomans were sitting, down into the Arabian Sea, and then all the way to Indonesia and beyond. So it found itself at this, uh, as, uh, at this very unique geographical position. And as a result of that, um, it grew organically. Uh, and by the time you, know, you had the, the, uh, the 16th century, um, when, uh, you know, when Akbar takes Surat from the local Sultan, um, Surat is a, a bustling international city. You know, and I lived, you know, most of my life, uh, um, you know, in London, but, you know, I have family back in India and I used to, you know, visit India and continue to visit India. Uh, but our, our yardstick to judge uh, international cities today is Paris or London and, and of course, New York. But what people don't understand is that back in the, 15, back in the 16th century, all the way till, uh, till 1857. So you're talking about close to 250 years or probably even more. Surat was the international city of India. There was no city in India that could even come close to Surat. You had this eclectic mix of Portuguese. You had this phenomenal mix of uh, Baghdadi Jews, uh, uh, Chalabi Turks, um, uh, um, you know, the British, the Dutch, the, um, the, 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 the Ceylonese uh, traders, the Arabs, uh, all of them in Surat. So, you know, um, today, uh, you know, when you, when you walk down the streets of London and the one thing that absolutely amazes you is how this enmeshed society has made London what it is, or for that matter, even New York. But that's precisely what had happened in Surat. You know, it was, it, was, it was the benchmark of international quality living back then. You had theater, you had museums, you had dramas, you had, uh, you had a, 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 it was a melting pot. You could probably walk into a cafe and find an Englishman sitting and sipping his coffee with the Portuguese. They hated each other, but they'd be there. Uh, the, 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 the Dutch, you know, probably sneering in one corner, trying to get his pound of flesh of the, of the, of, of the trade and the commerce that Surat was offering. You would have the Arabs bringing in their fabulous horses. So you can visualize this, this, this burst, this, this city bursting with color and energy. And most importantly, cosmopolitan. So varied amount of people there. And, um, uh, so through these 200 odd years, and I'm not going to get into the details of that because uh, the, the, the richness of Surat's history is so deep and it's so vibrant that you could, you could write you know, a thousand books in Surat and you could still be coming up uh, discovering new things. So I won't go deeper into that. But I'll probably try and concentrate on, on the story with the East India Company. So with that kind of trajectorial growth, um, you know, you, you even had uh, the likes of Leo Tolstoy commenting on Surat. Now, you can imagine Leo Tolstoy is probably the tallest and the, the, the tallest figure in literature. And he's sitting in Russia and he engages with some merchants who, who make their way to Russia from Surat. And they talk to him about Surat. And it is, it is said that Leo Tolstoy heard with great interest about Surat and even wished to visit Surat because he was convinced that the cafes of Surat were even better than the cafes in Venice. So that is the kind of, um, you know, that's the kind of, of uh, uh, if you wish, aura or magnetism that Surat had. It could reach Leo Tolstoy and, and, and nurture in him a desire to visit. Anyways, all of this um, was, um, was brilliant because a because of the geographical location of surat and also because of the firepower in terms of the political and the military might that was prevalent in that area to safeguard surat now of course because of its its um its magnetic allure 
the likes of the Portuguese and the Dutch and the East India Company were always lurking in the waters of the Arabian Sea, trying to get a foothold, trying to get some kind of a, a, a tow through the door to enhance trade and to control the port. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how Thomas Rowe came and he landed in Surat and then went to Jahangir and got a farman to trade, because I think that's common knowledge. Everyone knows that. And Jahangir gave him the, 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 uh, uh, the Sanad or the Farman to, to, to do trade in Surat. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, the East India Company landed up. They set up their first factory there. They were manufacturing cotton and selling their cotton to Molokka. Molokka basically are the islands beyond Indonesia. And so all of that, uh, by the... By the late 1600s or even early 1700s, you see this enormous peak in Surat. You know, it, it is unquestionably, it is unimpeachably the greatest city uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Hindustan, according to me at least. There will be some, um, there will be some historians whom I could, uh, I could debate with about uh, about which was the greatest city in India at that time, but in my opinion, it was Surat. Anyways, so you have this situation where the, the English East India Company are trading. You have the, the situation where the Dutch are trading, uh, the Portuguese are trading. Now, the Mughals were very smart in managing Surat. They knew that, the, that Surat was the heartbeat of Hindustan in many ways. So they did not want to give complete control to a governor uh, in Surat. So they split the command. So the castle, the, the famous castle that you have in Surat, which has now been brilliantly restored by the government, the castle was in charge of whom they call the Kiledar or the Mutasaddi. And the Darbar or the civil administration of Surat was um, in charge of another clerk. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, the, 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 the fort was in charge of the Kiledar, uh, which, who were usually Abyssinian, and the, the, uh, the, the administration of the city or the civil administration of the city was in the hands of the Mutasaddi or the, or, or the local clerk. So they divided the control of Surat to ensure that, uh, that uh, there was not just one hegemonizing power in the city. And that meant that because of the, of the division of power, you could have, uh, you know, various people could have a say. So the merchants had an enormous say in the power dynamics of Surat. The rich Jain merchants, the rich um, Bora merchants, the rich uh, uh, Turkish uh, merchants, they all had a say in, 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 in this magnum opus city. But um, once the Mughal Empire started collapsing, and you had the fragmentation of different principalities, you know, surging everywhere. Um, at that point in time, to bring stability to Surat, one man entered the uh, entered the, the the you know the realm of affairs, if you wish, and his name was Teg Bakhan. So Teg Bakhan was the first independent ruler of Surat after the, colla after the collapse of, of, uh, of the Mughal Empire. And he had a vision. He had a vision to break this division of command and bring it into one unified command. So for the first time under his rule, um, the castle, which was where, where you had the customs, where you had um, you know, the constant ferrying of boats and all of that came under him. And so did the administration of the city. Now, the reason why he did that is because he realized very quickly that the English and the Dutch and the Portuguese were a genuine in, uh, foreign threat to Surat. And, you know, many a times in the past, the Portuguese had tried their best to, um, excuse me, to launch attacks on the, on the castle. In fact, they had uh, they had bombarded the castle back in 15, 1573, if I'm not mistaken, or even before, uh, my apologies, I think it's 1540s, when, uh, when uh, Khudavan Khan, who was the governor of, of Surat, had taken a cannonball on his chest and had died fighting them. And his mausoleum in Surat is worth a visit. You must go, uh, all you youngsters, and see that mausoleum. It is so beautiful. It's crumbling now. <clears throat> 
because of lack of maintenance. But just to admire the, the, the jolly work and the stonework of Khudawan Khan's mausoleum is a breathtaking experience. And you can pictureize how that mausoleum must have been 300 years ago, you know, with pigeons fluttering and Sufi songs being played there and, you know, all of that. So visit that. Anyways, um, coming back to this, so, so, so because Surat had a history of European, continuous European invasion, Teir Bakh Khan, sometime in 1733, unified command to ensure that the East India Company, which was the British trading company, and the Dutch, uh, as well as the Portuguese, do not get a toehold into the administration of the city. And they did not. Um, the first thing the English did was to create a blockade of Surat Harbor. And they did this because they feared that um, the local merchants, along with Teba Khan, because every local merchant, whether it was a Jain merchant, a Hindu merchant, a Muslim merchant, a Christian merchant, or an Armenian Jew, it didn't matter. They all supported the local ruler against the English. And um, it was a very clear narrative that this particular port is not going to fall to the British or to the Portuguese or to the Dutch. Um, and with the support of the merchants, Tegbat Khan was able to uh, even break the blockade to a certain extent of the, of the English ships. Uh, but you see, the English over the last 300 years had, uh, had accumulated enormous naval power all the way from the Atlantic, right through the Cape of Good Hope, and then into the Indian Ocean, and then even into the Arabian Sea. So while Tegba Khan was initially able to do damage to the English warships, when they retaliated, the retaliation was immense. And, uh, and uh, you know, Tegba Khan lost a few ships. And on the advice of his ministers, a truce was maintained. Uh, because uh, with the vengeance that the English were coming, Surat could go up in flames. Um, but what Tegba Khan did next was a masterstroke. He sent out um, an emissary to the court of one of the most powerful princes in India, and his name was Gaikwad, the Gaikwad of Baroda. And for the first time, you had this incredible alliance of the Nawab of Surat and the Maharaja of Gaikwad standing shoulder to shoulder against the English East India Company. Now, the minute the English East India Company realized that this treaty has been signed, obviously they panicked because this is a, this is a united Indian force. And there was fear amongst the English that, you know, with a united Indian force, the East India Company would not be able to usurp uh, Surat. So during this phase, now we're talking from 1733, you know, uh, all the way till about um, somewhere around the 1740s, and you have a time of relative peace and, and, and progress uh, as well in, in, the, in, in, in Surat. Um, but, you know, the East India Company were up to their tricks and they were managed, they managed division of sorts of a bond between his successors. So Teba Khan left behind only one. Order. And this is going to be the, the, the real line of um, my conversation because unfortunately, the Nawabs of Surat, or fortunately, you can, you, could, you can look at it both ways. In those days, unfortunately, in, in today's days, fortunately, they produced girls, a lot of girls. They, they did not produce many sons. So, um, and I'm, I, you know, I have two daughters, so I, and, and I have no aspirations for a son, but, uh, but in those days, you know, you needed a son to come to your, to your, to, 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 your, to, to succeed you. Anyways, he left behind one daughter and he got her married to uh, uh, Muinuddin Khan, who was supposed to be his successor. When he succeeded, the, the East India Company, as they had done in many parts of India, continued to plant the seeds of division between the two, uh, you know, between various factions the good old policy of divide and rule. And Surat was, was, was you know, this was sinking dramatically. Um, until a, a mini civil war occurred and Munidin Khan was able to become the undisputed Nawab. And he ruled 
the first thing that he did was to lower the taxation on the merchants of Suez. Now, there were two effects that that had. Firstly, when he lowered the taxation uh, for the merchants to get merchant loyalty, uh, he definitely got merchant loyalty, but then he didn't have enough money to pay his army. And because he didn't have enough money to pay his army, um, the army was continuously rebelling. Um, finally, uh, um, you know, after much struggle, he was able to bring together uh, a force that would stabilize Surat once again. So it was a very checkered history of about you know, 20 years when, this was, when all of this was playing out. Um, uh, nevertheless, on his death, was succeeded by his son, Hafizuddin Khan. At the Surat Harbor, Unrelentingly, and um, and you know you could very well stand on the castle of the Surat Han and look out, and you would see a, uh, this mass um, this massive British uh, uh, you know warships that were that were there, ready to attack. So under these circumstances, the Nawab that is Hafizuddin Khan was feeling enormous pressure. Um, and continuous interference by the East India Company in his affairs. Um, so much so that the East India Company officials were able to get into the customs office in the, in the castle and then do the most awful thing, which was they shut down the mint. Now, by shutting down the mint of Surat, which was uh, the heartbeat of Surat, because it was in these, mint, uh, in these mints of Surat, the coins of Hindustan were manufactured and distributed all over India. So without coinage, you could very well imagine that there could be no, um, you know, there could be no trading. So the idea to, behind doing this was to lift Bombay because Bombay had been inherited by the East India Company, uh, which they had got in dowry when James had married Catherine and the, and, and the King of England was not interested in those little islands which were supposed to become Bombay and he passed them on to the company and the company rather astutely built Bombay, uh, Bombay's fine harbor. And so you can imagine that there are these incredibly powerful warships in Bombay which is just 150 miles south of Surat and then you had these British warships in Surat. So there was a this strategy of suffocating Surat. And as a part of the strategy of suffocating Surat was the decision to, um, to, to shut down the mint. So you, have, you can imagine a situation where there's no coinage and so there's no money basically coming out to trade. Uh, there's extraordinary amount of bribing that is going on. Every English official that is sitting in the customs office in, uh, in the castle in Surat is taking bribes from the merchants to set their ships out. Those poor merchants have no other option to bribe the, the English um, officers because there's a whole blockade of English warships. And so the merchants can't go out. So the entire, the, the, the prosperity of Surat suddenly comes to a grounding halt because of the English blockade and the English um, uh, um, uh, shutting down of the mint. Uh, so Hafizuddin, who is the Nawab, writes to the British in London, and, he, and his letter is there in the British Library here in London, where he actually urges the board of directors in London saying, listen, you know, you're suffocating Surat, and at this point in time, you will wreck the entire city. So, so if your objective is to build trade, then help me build trade. Otherwise, the way things are going, you're going to wreck it. And obviously, the the overarching objective and the overarching narrative was, um, was to build Bombay and destroy Surat, which they were succeeding in doing that. Um, anyways, um, the pressure is such that, uh, you know, Hafizuddin dies a rather heartbroken man, and he uh, is succeeded by his son, Nasiruddin, who is also once again under tremendous British pressure uh, to give up his, his, uh, his ruling powers cutting the long story short in terms, just, just keeping in mind the timing. Nasiruddin dies and he, he is succeeded by his uh, brother, Nizam, uh, uh, sorry, Nizam, Nizamuddin is succeeded by his brother Nasiruddin. And 
at that point in time, one man walks into the palace in Surat. His name is Richard Wellesley. Richard Wellesley has come to India in 1799. So that's the year we're talking about with the complete objective of changing the narrative in India. Till now, the East India Company's uh, 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 you know, core was to trade, do business, and control business. Richard Wellesley came with the objective of conquering. And there are two different narratives now. Um, and Richard Wellesley's core objective is land grab. And his core objective is to destroy and break every Indian prince and take hold of their states. So he goes after, he goes after the Marathas in a massive way. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, uh, he wages war against the Peshwas, he fights the Marathas in Asai, defeats them there, turns his attention to Tipu Sultan, defeats Tipu Sultan, and then focuses on Surat. And he marches into Surat, and he puts a treaty across in front of Nasiruddin, who is the Nawab, and says, um, we will give you uh, 150,000 pounds a year, you will be allowed to keep your estates, which is a third of Surat, and that those estates, which is a third of Surat, provide massive amount of employment to you know to to uh, to, to textile merchants, to potters, to stable boys. So it's a massive amount of, to gardeners, all of that. And um, uh, in 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 return, you will hand over your ruling powers to us. Now, this is, of course, not taken very well by Nasiruddin, and he considers a guerrilla-led attack uh, on the East India Company. But his, his uh, ministers advise him against that, and they say, you know, you're dealing now with an East India Company that has defeated the Marathas. They have defeated Tipu Sultan. There is no way you're going to be able to survive. And at that point in time, the army of Surat that the Nawab had was only 4,000 compared to Wellesley's incredible uh, firepower that was just docking on the, on, on the, on the Tapti. Uh, and it would be a massacre of the inhabitants of Surat. So keeping the best interests of Surat and Surtis in mind and hoping that his city would not go up in flames, Nasiruddin signed a treaty in 1800, whereby the administration of the city would move to the East India Company but he would be allowed to keep control of the estates of Surat. And that is very important. So the estates of Surat were uh, a massive amount of gardens, uh, you know, a large number of, of, uh, of divans, which, were, which basically were the, were, the, were the palaces and the grounds. And those grounds and those gardens provided, as I mentioned, an enormous amount of employment to local Surtis in terms of, you know, um, gardeners, potters, weavers, textile mills, etc. So once that, that treaty was signed, um, Nasiruddin was an old man. He resigned to, uh, to uh, poetry and he died a rather, um, rather quiet death. He was succeeded by his son, uh, Mirav Zaluddin. Now, Mirav Zaluddin was a very good hearted man. Uh, the Surtis loved him because, you know, he, he, he liked to live a life um, uh, larger than life. He had the most fabulous parties. Uh, the merchants from all parts of Surat were always at his palace, enjoying his hospitality. You know, Jains, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, all of them were having a great time at his parties. And he was a man given to leisure and pleasure. Um, he had an awful opium addiction. Um, you know, he, he was also many times uh, uh, quite, uh, quite infatuated by, uh, by, by various different uh, European liquors that were brought down especially for him. So he was quite a, he was quite a character, but a very noble hearted fellow, you know, uh, almost like a, a chubby, noble hearted, cherubic man, um, you know, who was, who was given to just basically reading poetry and doing good for his people, however limited his powers were. Um, but in all of this, he was also a, re a relatively shrewd man. Um, he very quickly realized that the estates, now I keep mentioning this time and time again, that there's a difference. While the English East India Company were ruling Surat, they did not have control 
over the estates of the Nawab, which was a part of the deal of, of 1800. And those estates provided employment. And I keep repeating this, it pro provided employment to textile weavers, to, 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 to potters, to gardeners, all of that. Um, Afzaluddin had just one daughter, again, and he was worried. And he was worried because the East India Company was growing in enormous strength all over India. By the time it is, uh, you know, the 1830s, which is what we're talking about now, the East India Company is all over India. As I mentioned, they've defeated the Maharathas, they have taken Delhi, they've, they've destroyed Tipu Sultan, they've gone into Bengal, the Rajputs of Rajasthan have, you know, have, have been subjugated. The English are everywhere. And, he, and they've built a, a, a reputation of being untrustworthy. Um, now with his, with his daughter that he has, Afzaluddin is a worried man. And so he starts strategizing as to how he could uh, secure Surat and the employment and the, and the estates that provide such an emo enormous amount of employment to the Surtis. And he realizes that he can't do this until and unless he has a male heir. Uh, because the English are building up this reputation of not necessarily acknowledging female uh, uh, succession. So um, he, he looks around and he identifies a small state in Katiawar, which is um, a part of Gujarat. And Katiawar, as we know it today, carries the name Saurashtra. Saurashtra basically, if you break it up, means so, which means hundred. Rashtra means states. And the reason that it got that name was because there were more than a hundred princes ruling Saurashtra. That's how the name, Saurashtra. And the landscape of Katiawar was dotted with many princes, large, small, medium-sized. But this one particular prince uh, catches his eye because he's the prince of a state called Kamadia, which is in Katiawa, and it is in the heart of the peninsula, and it's a war-ravaged, uh, war-ravaged uh, uh, part of of of, of Gujarat. Uh, and this young prince, who's only seventeen, has built quite a formidable name for himself by fighting off decoits, and you know his father had had an uh, had had an um, had become an ally of the Gaikwad of Baroda. So together, Kamadhya and Baroda had brought a, a sense of, um, uh, um, uh, you know, um, peace and calm to Katiawar, which was at, one, at some point in time quite lawless. So the Gaikwad had also recommended this, this Prince of Kamadhya to the Nawab of Sura. And, um, you know, he's quite a young, dashing fellow of 17. You know, even at the age of 17, he was six feet two, uh, you know, very sharp features, good looking man. And so the Nawab very quickly sends a proposal for his daughter to marry uh, the Darbar of Kamadia. Because in Katiawar, the titles were Darbars, uh, unlike in, in other parts of, of India. So the proposal is accepted. Um, but before he does that, what Afzaluddin does is something quite fascinating. He officially adopts uh, Jafar Ali Khan, who is the Prince of Kamadia, as his son. And after he officially adopts him as his son, he gets him married to his daughter. Now the thinking is very clear. The thinking is very strategic. He thinks that now that I have a legally adopted son, the East India Company has to uh, ensure succession to this adopted son of mine. If for some reason the East India Company says, no, we're not going to accept an adoption, um, they will have to accept my daughter. So either which way, he feels uh, that he has managed to kind of, you know, create a, 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 a very interesting way, a, a very successful way of succession, if you wish. Um, and, and he's quite elated and he's quite happy with this, with this alliance. Um, once this marriage takes place uh, somewhere in the 1830s, if I'm not missing, I think it's 1834, um, Afzaluddin uh, you know, uh, is given to leisure and pleasure. And 
he dies in 1842. Now, remember, um, I'm sure all the youngsters have studied the doctrine of lapse that the East India Company um, you know, propagated. The minute you think doctrine of lap, you, you think Jhansi of Rani, because Jhansi of Rani's adopted son was not accepted, you know, she fought. You think of Nana Sahib. Nana Sahib was the adopted son of the Peshwa because he didn't have a son. Uh, and because the English did not accept him, you know, Nana Sahib fought. But what a lot of people do not, do not know is that the doctrine of lapse, which basically was a law that the East India Company passed, which meant that if a ruler did not have a son, the East India Company would annex that state. Now, before Rani of Jhansi and before um, uh, 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 Nana Sahib, which happened in 1857, the first place that the East India Company tested, laboratory tested the doctrine of lapse was Surat. And a lot of people don't know that, that it happened first in Surat. So when Afzaluddin died in 1842, the first thing the East India Company did was um, they marched into the palace and, they, and the castle and they, um, they, um, uh, they absolutely ill-treated the family. Uh, they, they, you know, they declared that the Nawab ship is now extinct. Um, there is going to be no more Nawab of Surat. And the Surat estates are now usurped by the English East India Company. Um, so much so that the East India Company officials go to the extent of calling for a public auction of those estates. Now, what that means is two things. Firstly, there is mass scale unemployment in Surat. All those textile weavers that were part of, of the estates are all of a sudden made unemployed. Masses amount of gardeners are just told to, to, to go away. Um, you know, horse trainers, uh, 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 traders, uh, potters, weavers, they're all now suddenly unemployed. And all of this is done to fill the coffers of the East India Company. Obviously, the, the, the primary objective is that we will auction off these estates and we will take the, the lion's share, you know. Um, the second uh, impact was on the uh, family of the Nawab. Because while the East India Company had not accepted Jafali Khan, the public of Surat accepted him. And they hailed him as the Nawab of Surat. Uh, his own wife uh, hailed him as the Nawab of Surat. And as luck would have it, this very young couple, again, has only two daughters. So <laughs> this, is, this is how uh, it's playing out. And the East India Company once again plays, plays gender politics and says, because the Nawab left one daughter and because the daughter of the Nawab has left two daughters, we are, we are, we are, we are invading. And this was absolute injustice. So the adopted son, who, who was also the father of the two girls, refuses to take this lying down. And he's only 24. All of this is in 1842, way before uh, the Rani of Jhansi in 1857, way before Nana Sahib. So all of this is playing out in Surat. And that's why, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just coming back because it gets me really passionate about, uh, you know, I get really passionate about this narrative that all of this is happening in Surat way before it happens in Delhi or, or any other part of India. Anyway, so uh, the 24 year old prince of Kamadhya in Surat uh, decides that he's not going to take this lying down. And he has the, he has the English uh, agent called uh, Arbuthnot thrown out of the palace. He actually has him physically thrown out. Um, you know, the agents try and come in and he just, uh, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he refuses to give them an audience. He keeps them waiting outside the palace doors for like about five hours without food and water. And all of this is playing out. Now, while all of this is playing out, the, the, um, the uh, governor of Surat writes to uh, the governor of Hindustan, who's sitting in Calcutta. By that time, the capital of India is Calcutta. And he says, listen, I've, I've, you know, I've, got, I've reached my wit's end. This Surti prince is driving me mad. He keeps me waiting outside for five hours. He doesn't give me food. We are the British Empire. How can we be you know, um, held to ransom by this 24-year-old fellow? 
Um, anyways, this kind of resistance, or if you call it legal resistance, can only last for a, you know, a few weeks because at the end of the day, this is the might of the British Empire. And after a couple of weeks, the British army actually storms into the palace again. And uh, they, they are, uh, you know, they are, uh, they, they meet out um, a, a terrible um, behavior towards the family. Um, you know, the women are, are hurled into a room and shut in a small room. Um, you know, Jafali Khan is, uh, is also shut in a room. They're stripped of their jewelry. They are stripped of their, uh, their personal possessions. Everything is locked up and sealed uh, and taken into public auction. Um, and so Jafli Khan, who's supposed to become the Nawab of Surat, his wife and his two young daughters are now living in servant quarters, literally without any money, without any food, without any water, and without any access uh, to the outside world. But let's not forget, he's also the prince of Kamadia in Katiawar, and his father comes to his assistance. And um, he uh, has a meeting with his son and he says, listen, I will support you in your fight against the East India Company. Um, but for that, we've got to work out a strategy how to go about this. Uh, would it be armed resistance? Would it be guerrilla warfare? Or would it be uh, some kind of a legal offensive? The truth was that if it became an armed resistance, Surat will go, would go up in flames because there was no way that you could fight a guerrilla war in Surat without uh, torching the city. So after much consideration, the 24-year-old prince comes up with the most innovative idea. He says, I'm going to go to England. And you can imagine in 1844, for a young man of 24, with these odds stacked against him, to come up with this rather out of box thinking, which in those days was considered rather bizarre, that I'm going to go to England and I'm going to challenge the East India Company in their courts of law. And for a second, his father is quite astounded and he says, you know, uh, hang on there, you know, how are you going to do this? Um, and and uh, while I can fund your trip there, you know, what's your strategy? And there's a sense of, um, half-baked strategy, to be fair, because he's 24 years old, he's rather impulsive. He, you know, he's seen his wife and his daughters being treated terribly, coupled with the fact that now uh, his wife has been diagnosed with galloping tuberculosis, which basically means that she's on her deathbed. Um, and then to take a decision to go to Britain, uh, which is a perilous uh, uh, journey, he could very well, you know, lose his life there, either poisoned by the British or the ship could sink. And then you could imagine the fate of the two little girls. What would happen to them who were barely three and four? But it's a brave and bold decision. And um, Jafli Khan's father, who was the ruler of Kamadia, uh, who's cash rich, because that particular principality in Katiawar was a cash rich principality. And he gives his son, um, you know, all the money that is needed to travel to Britain. So Jafri Khan hires an English uh, tutor, uh, a rather, uh, uh, a rather um, uh, notorious secretary, uh, and a rather ridiculous doctor called Badruddin. And they all make their way to Bombay to set sail for Britain. This is the first time an Indian prince would be visiting Britain to challenge the East India Company. There were many Indian princes who went to Britain, you know, for a bit of sightseeing, to look at the queen and say hello and, you know, have a cup of tea and all of that. But this was the first time an Indian prince was going not with the objective of having a good time, but with the objective of exposing the malpractices of the English East India Company to the public in Britain. And, um, so this incredible voyage takes place where, uh, you know, there are massive headlines all over the newspapers in Bombay that the Prince of Surat is now embarking on a journey to Britain to challenge the East India Company. And the East India Company officials rather mock him, in India at least, they rather mock him. They, you know, they look at him, they say, you know, okay, 
a relatively good looking Indian prince at 24. He might get an audience with a few British aristocrats, but you know, he's not going to be able to do anything in Britain. Let him go. So he lands up going. And um, it's a very interesting journey because he sails down from Surat, passing Bombay, goes to Ceylon, spends some time in, spends some time in Ceylon. During this time, he's getting trained in the English language. He's admiring and understanding the ways of the English who are dining on, the, on board, on, on deck, under the beautiful Ceylonese sun. And finally, they make their way to Eden, the Swiss Canal in Egypt, and then through um, the Mediterranean and into England. Um, when he lands in England in, um, in uh, spring uh, of 1844, uh, he's an enormous, enormous hit because the public of London have never seen someone uh, as exotic as him, you know, uh, dressed in these fabulous Indian textiles and Indian robes and his, his, you know, everywhere he goes behind him is his Indian doctor and his Indian secretary and his English tutor. And they're amazed by, by, this, by this spectacle. He takes up residence at... Um, at um, at Mivarts, which is you know, which is today called the Claridges, which is the the hotel for the aristocracy of of Europe, uh, and once again over there he creates quite a stir. Uh, he experiments with scrambled eggs. He's never had scrambled eggs in his life. He's never had sunny side up fried eggs. And to a Surti prince, all of this is quite Greek and Latin. But he kind of puts in a brave effort. Um, and, and once again, the press is writing about him and you know, the British press just can't get enough of this Surti Prince. Um, but all this time, um, while all of this fun and games is happening, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, he's a very worried young man because back home is a wife who's dying of tuberculosis. There are two princesses of Surat who are infants and if, you can imagine the situation if the mother dies of tuberculosis and the father does not return, what would be the, the fate of those two girls at the hands of the English? At the same time, there is masses unemployment. There were people standing outside the palaces in Surat and outside the castle in Surat, um, you know, almost revolting against the East India Company because there was no employment. So keeping all of this in mind, um, the 24-year-old uh, Jafri Khan spends a lot of time in lobbying some of the, uh, some of the high-end aristocracy of, of, um, of Britain. Um, they include lords, dukes, Dutch, you know, accounts, earls. And it's fascinating because what he, un what he realizes in England is that um, it's a very divided country. Britain is a very divided country. You have a large number of people who support the East India Company, and you have a large number of people who are against the East India Company. So even in Britain, it's a rather riven society, and it's a divided country. Now, the East India Company are not just traders in many ways, but they even control parliament. A large number of the East India Company's stakeholders and shareholders are members of parliament in the House of Commons. So you can imagine that it's a corporation that is controlling the British Empire. Now, <clears throat> he has to navigate this political divide um, and he tries his level best. Um, so he's invited for various operas and he's invited for various race, uh, you know, for, for various events. And everywhere he goes, he cuts a rather, uh, a rather interesting figure. The Times of London writes about his wonderful good looks and all of that. But the minute he starts approaching the topic of a legal claim, people start shutting down their doors because it's very, it's, it, you know, the, the, the English can be very good at entertaining you, but the minute you start ruffling their feathers, they can be very quick to pull down the shutters. And that's exactly what start, what, 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 you know, what, what happens. Uh, in the interim, his rather ridiculous secretary falls in love with an English uh, lady who's already a married woman and he's got to yank him out of that affair. And it's, 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 you know, it's all kind of, it's all turning to custard basically in, in his first trip. It's looking very, very bleak because he's not getting traction. But one thing changes, changes the course of history. 
he gets invited to the Royal Ascot, which is the races of Britain, the, the most prestigious racing tournament or, or, um, or derby, if you wish, in Britain, uh, the Ascot. And he, oddly enough, happens to be seated uh, in, a cab, uh, in a box that is next to the Queen's box. Now, Queen Victoria, who was ru ruling Britain at that time, had, um, had a real desire to know more about India. She, didn't, she hadn't become Empress of India yet, but she wanted to know, know more about this incredible country. So when she sees him in his robes, you know, uh, you can imagine this Indian in his turban and in his robes standing amongst the English aristocracy at the Ascot races, and Queen Victoria wants to meet him. When she meets him, he very quickly tells her why he's here. And she's completely moved by what, you know, by, by what, he, what she's heard. Because don't forget, she's a female and she's, the king of, and she's the queen of Britain. And her own company was not allowing female succession, let alone adopted son succession. So she feels for this Indian prince and she introduces him to the most powerful lawmaker in Britain called Sir Richard Bethel. Now, no Indian prince had gone that far in terms of a legal, um, uh, you know, a legal um, uh, uh, lobbying, if you wish, in British, uh, in British uh, um, parliamentary affairs. Sir Richard Bethel, who is the Queen's lawyer and who is the Attorney General and who is also a member of Parliament, hears the case out and he decides to fight for Jafar Ali Khan. But as luck would have it, you know, he's running out of money. And so uh, the 24 year old uh, prince has to return rather empty handed because he has no money to actually hire these lawyers and fight. When he comes back to India, the, the most terrible thing happens, his wife dies, the princess of Surat, Bhaktianu Nisabhigam. She dies uh, because of tuberculosis, leaving him to attend to his two daughters and desperately finding a way to, to fight uh, the, the, the English. Um, this time, his father also doesn't have enough money to support him. So for nine years, he leads the life of a Sufi Sant, if you know what I mean. He gives up on life, you know, he, he, he grows a long beard, he goes into his paternal principality of uh, Kamadhya and Kathiawad, he rides his horses into, into the jungles, um, you know, uh, his daughters are accompanying him wherever he goes. He visits Surat and Bombay on the odd occasion. Finally, after nine years, he's able to mortgage a cluster of villages that belong to his Zamindari of Kamadia and raise enough money to go back to England and fight his case. And so after nine years, uh, he wants to go back. But his father is rather a smart man. And he says, um, you're not going to go back until you marry again uh, and produce a son because we've been bearing this enormous, uh, terrible onslaught of the British because of uh, the doctrine of lapse. And if you go away, uh, they will annex Kamadia too because at the end of the day, there's no male heir after Jafri Khan to rule Kamadia. So Kamadia gone, Surat gone, Basically, nothing left. So against, uh, against his own wishes, he does concede to his father. He marries uh, uh, a second time. Uh, uh, he marries the daughter of the Qazi of Ahmedabad. And after that marriage, he goes back to England. Uh, this time, he goes with uh, an entourage of musicians, um, you know, uh, cooks, barbers, all kinds of people. Uh, and once again, he lands up in Britain and, and, and the press can't get enough of him. Um, he takes up residence in Paddington, which is not very far from, um, from um, the Houses of Parliament. Uh, well, a fair distance. He has his own lovely little, he hires a lovely little blue carriage, which says Prince of Surat. Um, and in that blue carriage, he goes to meet his lawyers. And the lawyers say, yes, we'll fight. And we will expose the, um, the malpractices of the East India Company to the British people. And I, want, I would like to pause here for a second to just say, look at the incredible vibrancy of British democracy. Yes, they were looting and pillaging India. Yes, they were 
absolutely destroying the fabric of India. But if you had the guts to go to certain people, plant your case and fight, and of course had the means and resources, you could get a fair hearing in the courts and the parliament that was divorced from the functionings of empire. So the British empire could be sued by their own parliament. Now, it's a, it's a very technical issue, but this is precisely what the Prince of Surat decides to do. And for the first time in the history of British India, an Indian prince is able to table a bill in the House of Commons in 1856. It had never happened before, and it never happened again. It was probably one of the greatest achievements that an Indian could ever achieve in those days, where a bill called the Nawab of Surat Treaty Bill is tabled in the House of Commons to expose the malfunctionings of a colonizing corporation uh, in their own houses of parliament, in their own courts of justice. Um, but all of this happened over a massive period of, you know, years and years of negotiations in, in Britain. It didn't happen overnight. Finally, when it comes down to actually getting the bill passed, and what would that bill basically mean? So it's very important to understand that the bill did not, and I repeat, did not take into consideration the title of the Nawab of Surat. The title of the Nawab of Surat was extinguished. But if the bill would pass in the House of Commons, the estates which provided employment to so many Surtis would once again be restored to the family. The pension would be restored. And most importantly, the East India Company would be exposed and their corruption would be exposed to the British public. So this is 1856. So while the mutiny is erupting in India and the Rani of Jhansi fighting in India and Nana Sahib is fighting in India, the Prince of Surat is fighting in Britain in the Houses of Parliament against the British Empire. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that the House of Commons was divided. Um, you had a, a, a large number of uh, uh, members of parliament who were very much for the East India Company because they, they were stakeholders in the company. And then you had a few members of parliament who were against the East India Company. So when the debate took place, there were four sessions. The first session, the speaker did not let the bill be read because it was utter, utter embarrassment. For the British government, for the British crown. In the second session, the lawyers of the Prince of Surat say, if you do not let this bill be read in Parliament, we will threaten you with direct crown intervention, which means the Queen would be called into intervening on behalf of the Prince of Surat, which had never happened uh, ever before. They still do not let the bill get read. On the third occasion, Sir Richard Bethel, who is the Attorney General to the Queen, stands up and says, uh, if the bill is not read, this is going to be an absolute embarrassment for Britain. Uh, and yet they are not letting the bill go to vote. Uh, finally, uh, I think on the 23rd of June, 1856, um, the bill is taken to vote and in the first of its kind of judgment, uh, 213, if I'm not mistaken, I have my book here, but it's been such a long time since I've read my own book, but if I'm not mistaken, it is 213 MPs vote in favor of an Indian as compared to 18 or 28 MPs. So out of a house of, I think, 240 or something, I'm, I need to refer the exact figures, out of a house of 240, 218 vote for an Indian and 28 vote against. It is the first and only time in recorded Indian history that an Indian was able to go to British Parliament at the peak of British Empire and defeat the East India Company in their own parliament. And um, so he returns um, with, 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 you know, with, with an enormous victory, uh, but he also happens to have fallen in love with an English actress there. I'm not going to tell you a little bit about that love story because I want you to 
buy this book and read it and you'll find it all, find all of it in this book. Uh, and if you want to find out how his life pans out after his, uh, his victory in parliament and, you know, um, how does he live with, with his British girlfriend? Or if he does, he promises to bring her back to India. Does he do that? Doesn't he do that? All of that, for that, you've got to buy the book and read it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. Yeah, I have already bought the book. And uh, for those of you who want to buy the book, they can get it online. And those of you who can't afford it for some reason, they can also go to the public library, Nirmad Library, which is here in our city. And they have copies of this book there. So you can read it there as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I will open the session for uh, forum for some questions. I have tons of questions to ask, but I'll ask it later. Till then, if anyone else has something to ask, they can ask. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Yesha. Yeah, so the first time when the Prince of Surat had gone to Britain and you mentioned about the blue, uh, uh, what was it, blue uh, carriage? Is, yes. Does that uh, still exist or like how did you find about that? I mean, it's very specific to have a blue color mentioned over there, that's why. Yes, um, unfortunately, I was unable to see it. I don't know whether it still exists. I read about it in the newspapers uh, that are archived in the British Library. Um, particularly, I believe it's the, um, the London Times that writes about the Nawab of Surat coming in his light blue silver carriage. So um, that's where I got the information from. I haven't seen it. Um, I wish I could have seen it, uh, but I haven't. Thank you. Okay, I had one question, very specific question related to writing. So um, I believe uh, I have gone through the bibliography of your book and uh, all the notes that you've taken. So it seems like there were like a lot of sources that you went through and you, you read Gazetteer of Mumbai Surat that itself is like 2000 pages uh, book. So uh, how did you not get lost in the research? How did you find out your way with so much information to weave this? story. Was that journey difficult? Was there any challenges that you faced? Well, I think, um, you know, when you're writing, um, uh, you can only be a relatively good writer if you're a good reader. If you're not a good reader, you can never be a good writer. So you must read and read and read. Having said that, it's also vitally important to understand um, um, how to edit your reading. So yes, those were voluminous texts, particularly the gazetteers, but I confined myself uh, to reading particular passages which, which were of interest to me in terms of the book. So uh, you know, the book is titled Fall of a Port, Rise of a Prince. So a lot of my reading was, con was, was focused at, uh, through a period of time, which was 1733 right till 1842. Um, and um, once you start, uh, once you start reading broad, then you have another round of reading, which is called edited reading, where you read, uh, you know, material that is focused on your, on your uh, subject. Um, and uh, it is, it is, it can be very challenging, but it's also the joy of writing, particularly if you are writing uh, history. Uh, you know, the joy of finding something that you didn't know existed. Or, you know, as, as uh, the young lady asked uh, about the silver and blue carriage, you know, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to realize, you, you know, you find a little anecdote quite like that, or, or you find uh, that, yes, there was actually, uh, uh, um, you know, a naval battle that Teg Bakhan uh, led against the British just on the outside, you know, in the waters uh, before uh, outside of Surat. So you, you've got to be able to do your reading on a broader scale and then also bring it down to edited reading and focus on your storyline. So everything that you're reading has to be relevant to your storyline. 
there is also like a lot of very engaging stories in your in your book it's not just like a history dump it's a very well crafted narrative that that tells an entire story and you itself have you have included more anecdotes inside that story so um is there is there any component that you have also imagined you have also fictionalized and then uh, uh, and blended non fiction uh, facts with that or were it, was it all like something that you found out from various different sources no i haven't i haven't fictionalized anything actually um the 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 story is there in the archives but the narrative that you use to tell the story and make it more engaging is the skill of the writer so i thank you because i would take that as a compliment that you've enjoyed the book but um it is your skill of storytelling uh you know that you don't make it into a, a rather tedious laborious boring dated uh, you know just a date filled book of you know just just counting a chronological uh, incidents that happened during uh, you know these particular passages of play but it is about um weaving a story um you know you you um so for example if you are um telling the story of um let's say afzaluddin who was the last nawab right um we do know through the through the records that he was an opium addict we do know that he he enjoyed his mangoes we do know that uh, you know he could spend days on end just eating mangoes you know we know that because it's written over there in in the archives that you that you read but then you use words that are more um more relatable right uh you know you describe the setting where he would sit and eat mangoes you describe the setting where he would be um you know um uh, consuming opium and and probably you know just falling on the floor for example um when you read the debates in the house of parliament which is a very serious part of the book where britain is literally tearing at its seams uh, you know that sense of drama uh needs to be built uh, through your narrative without losing uh the facts so that is the skill of um you know of of storytelling you have also mentioned a couple of specific locations in your book uh, things that i can recall is uh, darya mahal mahmudi bagh and you mentioned the palace at salabatpura which, which is a region that is still there and you mentioned begumpura which is still there in surat so all these these specific palaces darya mahal mahmudi bagh are they still there or uh, are they are they gone all of them unfortunately miss prasad are finished thanks to the english east india company because uh, you must remember that when mir jafri khan returns back uh, and i didn't want to mention this because i wanted the readers to read it but i'll say it now when he returns he finds each palace each um, property literally on its last legs because the east india company refused to maintain them their sole objective was to publicly auction the land off and fill their coffers so it's a tragedy it's a real real tragedy uh, and it's a travesty and it's a tragedy of epic proportions that that beautiful heritage of surat because of the british east india company is just dust and ruin today there's one building which is standing which has the portrait of my ancestor uh, and i was given a wonderful welcome there by the authorities because they were very kind and very generous um which is the castle uh, and that has been restored by the government of gujarat beautifully and uh, it's a it's a fabulous restoration effort and i urge all of you youngsters to visit that palace uh, that that castle uh, because it is uh, it's it's a masterpiece of restoration and it'll fill you with a real sense of pride of being surti and uh, and 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 probably give you a little whiff of what it would have been to live in those times they've even they've even restored the prison because they took me to the darbar hall uh, very kindly to show me the portrait of my ancestor and his throne and then they showed me um the room where uh, where you know judgments were were given uh, so they've even restored that 
and um, you must go and visit. It's it's a fabulous fabulous uh, place. But I'm afraid the others are just uh, you know they've, they've fallen to ruin. Yeah, my last question is um, so you have told the story of around like 1857, 1850s uh, period, and today is like 2020. So. Um, how would you, my main question is like, how would you link yourself to, uh, to the family? So there must have been like range of, of people who have come in between uh, Mir Jafar Ali and you. And uh, so uh, did they stay in Surat? Did they, did they move to Kamaria and they have been there ever since? So, so what, how does your uh, family tree, if, if I just may ask, looks like? Well, we're we're very much um, in uh, in Bombay and Kamadia. Um, you know, we have a, a small darbargar in Kamadia, which is which is basically also <laughs> fallen to ruin. But uh, we're trying to restore it slowly, um, and um, we we uh, we have uh, my parents live in Bombay, uh, so I visit Bombay every year. Uh, but we we from Surat, uh, we moved to uh, Katiawar, which was Kamadia, and Bombay, uh, and um, and so that is that is the third generation, or the fourth generation of Ahmad Mis. Yeah, the fourth generation, and we um, you know a large number of, a large number of us um, moved to America. Uh, a large number of us uh, moved to Britain for better prospects as life carries on. Um, but whenever we visit, um, it's wonderful, uh, uh, you know, uh, great memories of, of, um, of the past. Um, you know, particularly, as I say, uh, I had the good fortune to be, to be um, taken to the, um, to the Surat castle. Um, and uh, it was it was absolutely lovely to be there. Um, and uh, you know, every time I go to Gujarat every year, particularly to Kamadhya, it's 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 um, you know it's a small, sleepy little town, but there's a lot of respect for the family. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, old world charm still there uh, amongst the old people uh, and the elder the elderly. Uh, yeah. So can we call you the unofficial prince of Surat and Kamaria? <laughs> I, I think um, I think um, uh, you know titles are long gone. I'm not someone who's um, who's fussed about titles. I've never been. The reason, as, as I mentioned, the reason why I wrote the book is because um, is because um, everyone knows about you know. Um, how the English usurped Awadh, which was Lucknow, how they behaved in Jhansi, how they behaved in, uh, how terribly they, 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 they behaved with, um, um, you know, so many of the princes. But no one knows how, they, how badly they behaved with Surat um, and how they wanted to destroy the city to build Bombay, uh, how they went after the, uh, the, the prince of Surat. Um, but, you know, that was the primary reason why I wrote the book. Um, yes, I'm a descendant of the last Nawab of Surat, and it's a, it's a sense of, um, it's a sense of, uh, um, you know, um, knowing one's heritage, but nothing beyond that. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's lovely to see a portrait of your ancestor hanging in the castle and people people, um, you know, um, want to know more about that incredible fight in the British Parliament that, that a Surti prince won. Um, but I think um, beyond that, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I don't take very seriously. Okay. Um, so that's all I had to ask. Uh, anyone else uh, who would like to answer a question, anything? Otherwise, we'll end this meeting then. Okay, so I guess no one. Um, so then can I just ask like one last question? And that is, um, how did you first come across this story? Was it past it? We grew up with it. We grew oh, up with it. 
Okay. We grew up with it. It's been coming down from generations to generations. Um, my father was born uh, in Surat. Um, he grew up with the story. My grandfather uh, was, you know, was born in Surat. He grew up with the story. Uh, my great grandfather. So it was always passed down. Uh, I, I inherited the uh, the official minutes of the um, debate in the House of Parliament. I, it's a it's a it's a it's a heirloom which I inherited. So I read that, uh, and I reread that as a child. Um, you know, so it's something which we all grew up with, and we all knew that it had happened. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I mean, but we that didn't is, know that uh, it. We, but but it hadn't been documented as a book and, and told. And that's the reason why I, I wrote the book. That just reinforces the importance of oral history that is passed down from us, from our parents and great grandparents. And uh, even I know a couple of stories about my family and that um, that's a part of our heritage. And that's very humbling to know that uh, it, it is a part of history as well that uh, we as individuals should at least be aware of, or if not, we can, uh, if we can't document it or something like that. Uh, another question that I wanted to ask you was, do you have, so your own personal family collections of different things that um, have been passed down from you, uh, to you from? Yeah, like, like, uh, like any princely family, we do. Uh, you know, for example, the Maharaja of Bhavnagar uh, has, uh, you know, you know, things that he's inherited. Um, uh, the Maharaja of Porbandar has things that he's inherited. The Maharaja of, of Morvi has things that he's inherited. The Maharaja of Rajkot has things that he's inherited. So we all have things that we've inherited. Uh, but it is, you know, um, they're beautiful photographs. They're old black and white photographs. They are, um, you know, they are, they are a few swords that, you know, that my father was given as a Yuvraj, you know, when he was six years old. But those are just, you know, they're 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 beautiful little they're beautiful little um, um, uh, accessories, if you if you know what I mean. Um, none of us really, uh, uh, you know, are, are, I, I I wouldn't say we don't take it seriously. We do. Um, we definitely do take it seriously. There was a small state in in Kathiawar called uh, Bilka. I don't know if you know, but there's a town called Bilka in uh, Saurashtra. And the Raja of Bilka is a very dear friend of my father's. And, you know, often they get talking and I, I speak with them uh, at times. And there is a legacy that the people of those villages or, or those towns have more for us than we have for the accessories. So the love that we get when we visit our own states as erstwhile Rajas or Darbars or whatever, that is more fulfilling. Than, um, uh, than you know, being told by my grandmother that, oh, this was a safa that your great grandfather had worn and it is made of pure gold and all of that. That never really did it for me. What, what really does it for me and for a lot of the erstwhile Rajwaras is you know, the real love that you get from the people, uh, even today. I mean, even today when my father and I go to Kamadeya or we visit you know, the Surat castle, you see love in the eyes of the people. It's genuine love. You know, they don't let my father and me leave till we've drunk tea in every house. Uh, you know, um, I live in London. I come to India only, you know, once a year, but my father goes reasonably often, but it's still, um, it's just, you know, pure unadulterated love. And that for me is more precious than any heirloom. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Moin sir, for joining us today. Uh, we will end the session now. Um, uh, and this, yeah, okay. So we have to that thing. Thank you. All of us, a huge thank you from all of us. A really, really huge thank you. I feel very, very happy and privileged to have heard this talk from you yourself. Um, so uh, we will end the session now. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much.